So, despite this being a technical conference, in my four years at the Financial Times, the scariest production incident that I've been part of wasn't actually caused by anything in our technology stack. It was back in 2015 when the European Central Bank were preparing to make an important announcement where everyone across the industry was expecting the interest rates to be cut. When major events like this take place, it's fairly standard practice across the media to prepare articles for all the possible outcomes. And this is so that we can be ready to publish without needing to write an article from scratch. Sometimes mistakes happen and the wrong information gets published. For example, when the BBC incorrectly announced the Queen's death on Twitter. In our case, uh, we were updating a draft article about the ECB holding the interest rates steady. And this was the opposite of what everyone was expecting to happen. However, instead of updating the article, it was actually published live, 10 minutes ahead of the announcement embargo. <laughs> and to make things worse, our systems then automatically tweeted out the associated tweet. So due to the high level of trust that people place in our reporting, everyone who read the article thought it was unexpected but factually accurate. And this obviously wasn't the case. The incorrect article caused the exchange rate to spike by 0.4%, which is actually a quite significant shift in the markets. This was a huge issue for us at the FT, with some serious implications for the business. We immediately removed the incorrect article, then published the real announcement alongside a correction. And after that, the exchange rate did then settle back down to normal levels. And while there wasn't any long-term damage to the markets, this had a serious impact on our brand and our reputation. There was definitely some very stressed people across editorial, technology and communications that morning. And it is quite scary to think that mistakes like this can have a serious real-world impact. However, the way that the incident was handled was well, and the team's quick actions meant that there wasn't any long-term sort of like damage to the business. In response to this incident, we made a number, number of improvements to the technical side of things, as well as our processes that we used to publish. We put measures in place to make it much harder to accidentally publish a draft article. And we, made, we had some problems at the time where articles were cached even after they were deleted. These days, the legacy services that used to run our front-end website have now been entirely removed and replaced. So that's no longer an issue for us. So I'm a senior integration engineer at the finan Financial Times, and I originally started off in desktop support, fell into being a Linux sysadmin, and now I tend to work in the DevOps space. Currently, I lead a team at the FT who support and maintain content APIs and the back end. When we work with Kubernetes, Docker, and Go microservices. Although we're probably most famous for the newspaper, we're primarily a digital content company. And last year was the first time that revenue from our digital content overtook the physical paper and our advertising as well. So for us, our content and our website are absolutely critical to our survival. We invest heavily in technology, and we've got many teams working across the business in different areas. At the FT, we're big believers in DevOps practices as well, and empowered engineering teams. We trust them to make the best decisions around technology, architecture, and delivery. And as part of that as well, our teams fully own, run, and support their services from the very beginning to the end of the product lifecycle. So maybe you're part of a team that's been running for a while, you're proud of the services that you've built, and it's still a bit intimidating being told that you're now responsible for dealing with production issues. Or perhaps you're a new developer or engineer, new to technology entirely, and you've had time to settle in, but you're still getting familiar with things, and the idea of being on the on-call voter is, quite frankly, terrifying. So, quick straw poll, straw poll. hands up if you've been on-call. All right now, yeah? So hands up if you've never been on-call before. And hands up if you don't like putting your hands up in the middle of conferences, because I, I don't like doing that. So I remember what it felt like the first time that I was called out. It was terrifying. I was asked to fix a service that I knew nothing about. The documentation, I couldn't find it. I thought it was genuinely the worst thing in the world. And I thought about quitting technology entirely and becoming a llama farmer. 
I think it's something like imposter syndrome, because no matter how good you are, I suspect everyone feels similar things at the start and when they first get called out. Even now, with some years of experience, I still get a twinge of fear whenever my phone goes off in the middle of the night or I get a Slack message going, the website is down. What if it's something I can't fix? What if I'm not good enough? So how do you get to the point where you're comfortable and cool? And the idea behind this talk was thinking what tips and advice that I could give so that you're not dreading that moment, that call, that message. And when writing this talk, I was told that it helps to have a bit of a theme. And I thought to myself, who else is quite grumpy like lots of sysadmins are? And who else gets woken up at two o'clock in the morning? Scrooge from A Christmas Carol, which actually really nicely leads into a talk structure around dealing with production problems. Because much like A Christmas Carol, there are things that we can do right now to help us the next time that you get called out or have major issues. There are things that we should do when something actually breaks, and then there are things that we should do after an incident as well, to improve everything for next time. So, knowing that things will go wrong at some point, what can we do to plan ahead? Handling incidents is the same as any other skill. It can be learned, it can be taught, and it can be practiced. Because if the first time that you try to do this is without any training, with no plan of action, after a phone call at 2 a.m., it's not going to go very well. And if you're familiar with dealing with your alerts and what can go wrong, then you'll feel a lot more relaxed when you do get called out. So get people on your teams to rotate through support regularly in hours when everyone else is available to support them and help them. It will make sure that everyone is familiar with what can go wrong, the alerts that can go off, the monitoring tools that you have, and where to find things like documentation or admin panels. And it makes sure that everyone has access to those things as well, because the last thing you want is in the middle of an incident at 2 a.m. and I can't log in to get the documentation. That happened to me. So Kate mentioned this in her talk earlier, but alert overload and alert noise is bad. And every alert should be actionable. Otherwise, you might lose real issues in the noise, or inversely, you might get called out for no reason at all. And I work with Sarah Wells, who did a great talk on this, which I definitely recommend that you check out. Depending on where you work or what you work on, having an instant response plan might look very different. Maybe your company is large enough to have a first-line team that escalates problems to you that they're unable to fix themselves. Your response plan might be very formal and well-defined and possibly even used across the whole business. But if you're in a small startup, it might just be a handful of you on your team, perhaps, getting called out by pager duty or some other equivalent. And in that case, maybe all you need is a quick verbal discussion with your team and some notes jotted in a Google document somewhere, perhaps. It really depends on your own situation. But regardless, you don't want to be left wondering what you're meant to be doing when alerts start going off. And keep your documentation up to date as well. And I know that I don't like writing documentation, but you need to have information on what to do when your services break. What it does, where it lives, and how to fix it is often a good starting point. And service panic guides or runbooks are quite important as well. These are shorter documents that should contain solutions for common problems and fixes. Write them as though it's 2 a.m. in the morning and that you've just been woken up. You only want the essentials necessary to get things back up and running with the minimum of, minimum of effort. That's quite hard to say. <laughs> It's awful trying to fix a system that has no documentation when the only person who knows about it has left the company a few months ago. And once you do have guides on how to fail over or rotate your keys or rebuild from scratch, run through them on a regular basis to make sure that they still work and that people are familiar with them. We did this in fairly spectacular fashion one day when we performed what we called a unscheduled test of our disaster recovery procedures. <laughs> We were, so we were provisioning a new production cluster using Ansible, and we ran our playbook, which should have created us five new instances. However, it turns out that it was a bit buggy, or the way that we wrote our playbooks wasn't quite right. So when, it's, when, when it said, give me five instances, what it actually did was it made sure that we had five instances across our entire production Amazon account. <laughs> The first that we knew of this was when all of our alerts went off and I hear a very quiet, oh no, from my friend who was sat next to me at the time who had run this playbook. Was it a problem? Yes, 
Absolutely. We had a brief outage while we worked out what was going on and what we needed to do. But we were back up and running fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. I love that one. Uh, we failed over to our backup cluster in the meantime, and as we already had a guide on how to spin everything back up from scratch, it wasn't too long before we were back to normal. We definitely wouldn't have wanted to find out that our disaster recovery guide didn't work at that point in time. So, as an extension of that as well, actively break things and check that your services do what you expect. Do your recovery guides still work? Does your alerting and your monitoring work correctly? Because Chaos Monkey is probably the most famous, well-known example of this, but you can do this manually in a controlled fashion as well. Run disaster recovery tests to make sure that you iron out any bugs with your processes. And we ran a planned disaster recovery test to disconnect the network to one of our data centers to make sure that we could recover it if it happened in a real world situation. We pulled the plug and the ops dashboard lit up with red lights, which was just what we expected. We then moved to the second step, which was fail over our systems to the healthy data center. And that was the point when we realized that our failover system doesn't work if one of the data centers isn't there, which isn't great for a failover <laughs> system. So we did fix that up fairly quickly. And the last time that we ran one of those tests was maybe about two, maybe a bit more years ago. For context, we've been moving away from our physical data centers for the last few years as part of a big cost reduction push. And we've migrated a lot of our legacy services now to the cloud or replaced them with externally hosted solutions or decommissioned them entirely. However, there are still a number of important legacy services that run out of our two data centers. And you can probably guess what the next slide is going to be. Because recently, we had a live test of exactly what happens when one of our data centers drops off the network. And naturally, it happened on a weekend in the middle of August, when lots of people were on holiday without access to their laptops or the internet. And as you can imagine, after two years since the last test, a lot of the information that we had was very out of date. It turned out that there were actually a lot more services depending on those two data centers than we originally expected. One of the useful things that we have at the FT is a chat channel that anyone can join. And we use this channel to communicate changes that are in progress and for people to report potential issues or problems that they're seeing. And as you can imagine, this channel got very busy during this outage with lots of reports and issues and incidents from across the business. Failover of these legacy services isn't simple or automated either. It's a fiddly manual process that involves DNS updates, configuration changes, service restarts. It had been so long since we'd last done this as well, and that we had to hope that the people who had this knowledge were actually available, and that they could even remember what the steps they needed to do. We did get everything stabilized, though, without any major customer impact. And later, we found out that the cause of the problems was actually another customer in the data center decommissioning some of their network equipment. And in the process of doing that, they accidentally cut our fiber cable that provides internet to our entire set of servers in the data center. There's no way that we could have predicted that happening. It took us roughly five days, I think it was, to, for network connectivity to be fully restored and for all of our services to be back to high availability and running out of both data centers. Which was really fortunate because a day after that, we then had a core network switch fail in the other data center. So we repeated the same exercise, this time in the other direction. And I have no idea what we would have done if both of those things had happened at the same time. We should have followed our own advice, quite frankly. And if we had practiced and tested our failover processes more regularly, we'd have been a lot quicker. We'd have had a much better understanding of what the impact would be and what needed to happen. But we did still recover everything without any major impact, and we learned a lot about our remaining legacy services that are important to us. We uncovered a whole set of issues that we hadn't known about, such as a high availability service that couldn't connect to one data center at all. One of our monitoring tools really doesn't like it when it can't connect to its monitoring targets, and some of our legacy services run out of memory when all traffic is routed to a single DC. All of those issues are now fixed or in the process of being fixed, and most importantly, we've learned from our experience and used it to improve our legacy failover processes. And hopefully, those are some ideas of things that you can go away, think about, and get started on before something goes wrong. But 
Let's imagine something's happened. Alerts have gone off and you've been called or asked to investigate. What's the first steps that you should take? Take a deep breath. Oh, too far. Dealing with incidents is stressful, but do what you can to remind yourself that it's not the end of the world. For most of us, if the website goes down or a service fails, it's not completely catastrophic in the grand scheme of things. Unless maybe you work at a nuclear power plant, in which case perhaps be a bit more concerned about things. It's always tempting to immediately jump in and start trying to solve the problem. But go back to basics first. Treat it the same as anything else that you do. Get as much information as you possibly can before you start. Generally speaking, no matter what the problem is, there's always a certain set of questions that I will ask myself before digging into a problem further. What's the actual impact? For example, for my team at the FT, we're a content company. So our most critical considerations are, can journalists publish content and can customers access the website? A problem preventing the news from going out is a huge issue and will immediately get multiple, te multiple people or even teams investigating. However, if it's our Jenkins box that alerts that it's running low on disk space on a weekend, I'm probably not likely to care too much and I will fix it on Monday. If it's overnight and it doesn't need to be fixed immediately, perhaps it's safer to wait until morning when you have a clearer head and more eyes on the fix. Some things to consider are, is it affecting your customers? Is it blocking other teams? Is there a brand impact? Does it make your company look bad? So the example that I gave at the start of the talk, where we published the wrong article, there was definitely something that needed to be resolved immediately. So let's assume it is important and that it needs investigation. What's already been tried? Maybe nothing if you're the first responder. Maybe Firstline have already run through the obvious solutions, restarting, failing over, for example. Or perhaps your teammates have tried some fixes. Get as much information as possible, because getting vague details can sometimes hide the actual problem. I've restarted it. What's it? Is it the service? Their laptop? Is it the whole internet? I hope not. <laughs> and validate that the problem does actually exist, because there are times when you'll have reports of the website is slow, which could mean anything from my home Wi-Fi router is broken, all the way to there's been another DDoS attack on Dyne and 90% of the internet has fallen over. Or maybe the monitoring system itself is broken and it started spamming out alerts to everyone. <laughs> I, I get I really love that one. Uh, that's, that's happened to us before. Uh, get as much information as you possibly can. It's worth spending a couple of minutes just to validate that there definitely is a problem before you start trying to jump in to fix things. So, Let's assume that there is a problem. What's the least amount of effort that you can spend to bypass the problem and get back online? Because depending on what your service is, this is often more important than actually fix fixing the root cause. For example, can we just fail over? Can we just roll back a release? Can we just restore a snapshot? If you don't have a simple res way to restore service though, you are going to have to investigate. And this will entirely depend on your system architecture and your actual problem report. But good starting points might be check the logs, check the disk, memory, CPU, if that's a thing that you use. Have you checked the steps in your panic guides? Has there been a new release or deployment? Or was there planned work around when the problem started? Or are there other known issues or outages happening? For example, when the Dyn attack broke the internet back in 2016. Or issues with AWS in the past where S3 or EC2 have gone down for a whole region. So let's assume that whatever's gone wrong isn't simple to solve. You've done your investigation, you've tried the obvious solutions, you're still stuck, and everything's still on fire. That's okay. Call for backup if you can. It's often better to bring other people in and get help quickly, because you can't always fix everything on your own, and that's all right. Do some basic investigation first, obviously, and confirm that it's not a simple problem. But don't be afraid to get assistance if you need it. Nobody will think less of you. And in my previous company, as an example of this, we had an air conditioning alert for the office server room, which went off at the weekend. Our technical director got an alert from our monitoring systems, and he popped in to fix it because he lived near the office. However, he couldn't remember the security code to get through the door. And at this point, most people would have called us, the ops team, to get the new code. Instead, what he decided to do was to crawl through the fourth ceiling of the office to get into the server room. <laughs> so, in case you're not aware, office ceilings aren't designed to support the weight of a person. 
So this gave way, and he fell into the server room, which caused even more problems for us than just the broken aircon unit, which we then had to sort all out on Monday. It turns out that wild servers are easily startled, and they don't like having people fall on top of them unexpectedly. <laughs> And they definitely don't like breathing in several years' worth of accumulated ceiling dust. It didn't look like this <laughs> at all, not even slightly. So, in his defence, his reasoning was that he didn't want to disturb us on a weekend, which I can respect that. But it would have been much better for everyone involved if he had just called us up and we could have fixed the problem together without needing to replace the ceiling afterwards. So communication is really, really important, both with your teams and both with your external customers as well. Because it's really irritating being told or trying to use a service or a product and finding out it's not working, and you've no idea if it's being investigated or if people are even aware of the issue at all. So even though everything might be on fire, you do still need to communicate with your customers and the business. And this is quite difficult when you're the person trying to actually fix the problem. So, Put someone in charge and make someone the instant manager. They need to be in charge of handling communication because it's extremely hard to multitask in normal work, let alone doing a stressful production instant. Give one person the task of updating the business and your customers, make sure they provide regular updates, and they need to prevent interruptions from senior management to, uh, to the people trying to fix things as well. And if you're like us and have alerts and notifications in your chat channels, then you've probably seen things like this before where alert spam just makes the channel impossible to use for anyone trying to discuss and solve the issue. So, spin up a new channel or a group specifically for this incident. incident. That's quite hard to say. This comes back to communication. If you have multi multiple people investigating or fixing a problem, you need somewhere that they can coordinate. This is especially true if there are people from multiple teams, areas of the business, or possibly even companies. And it helps a lot with having an incident timeline later on because you can go back and see who was doing what and when. If you've ever tried to fix something with multiple people, it often does end up like this. And having a central place to communicate helps with coordination. Make sure people share what they're doing, changing, investigating, because the last thing that you want is, wait, you were restoring the database, I've just changed the network settings, and now your database is corrupt. So, this is an example of one of our temporary instant channels. And as engineers trying to fix the problem, we use these for discussing the issue, sharing logs and graphs, and announcing any changes, tests, or fixes that we're attempting. I've mentioned communication already, but it is so important. Provide high-level updates every half an hour or whatever, just to let people know that you're still working on it. Because there's nothing worse than someone saying, I'm looking into it, and then you hear nothing for an hour or two. And you wonder, is it fixed? Are they still investigating? Have they gone for lunch? Don't know. So the next side of that as well is when you're tired and extremely stressed, you do make mistakes. And make sure that your team take breaks, even especially if the problem is long running. Because it's really hard for people to, by default, take 15 minutes to go and get a coffee or go for a walk whilst things are still broken because we all feel obligated to stay until it's fixed. But if you don't do this, you'll be less effective. You'll miss obvious things, or you might even make the problem worse. So for long-running instance, this might even involve rotating in shifts, or in large companies, perhaps handing over to another team who can help support. Our longest-running instance that I've been part of was in the content team, when our EU production cluster started failing due to CPU load at around 5 o'clock on a Thursday, just as everyone is about to go home for the day. There was no increase in traffic, so we spent some time trying to identify the cause of the issue with very little success. Given that our US cluster was healthy at the time, we failed all of our traffic to the US, which then started failing as well. We continued to spend several hours trying to work out what's causing the problem, attempting to get into a state where we can just serve anything, and swearing quite a lot. By this point, it's around 10 p.m., and the entire team is completely exhausted. We're struggling for ideas. Eventually, it takes our director of engineering, who is actually in this room somewhere, um, routing to suggest routing our traffic through our staging environment, manually editing our configuration files to pull data from our old legacy platform, which we were migrating from at the time. Fortunately, we hadn't decommissioned it yet, 
and it was roughly around midnight that we managed to get to a point where we were serving stable traffic, but in a very roundabout way. We all went home and continued to investigate the next day, and we eventually identified that the root cause was an update to a database query that made it extremely slow, which then caused the overload on our databases and then knock-on effect to the clusters. But because of this delay, it was very hard to isolate. Fortunately, the FT.com team are rather good, and they failed gracefully in this situation, even though our back-end APIs were extremely unreliable. There was zero end-user downtime, but we did serve stale content for several hours, which would have been a problem in a breaking news situation, but fortunately, it all worked out. So there's some hopefully useful tips for how to deal with incidents in progress. What do you need to do once the dust has settled and you're back online? Take some time for your own mental health because incidents are stressful and you've been working all day yesterday and through the night. You have to take some time for yourself. Run a meeting to discuss the incident with everyone, especially if the incident had a serious impact or had multiple people involved. It's not to point fingers and assign blame, but it's to discuss what worked, what didn't, and what can be improved for next time. Again, I don't like writing documentation, but incident reports are extremely valuable, and this is where having a timeline comes in very, very useful. Yeah. Depending on where you work, incident reports might be required and very formal, and you might need to make them public to your customers. But even if you don't, it's worth having these internally for your team so that you have a record of previous incidents you can refer back to later. But yeah, there's nothing worse than running into a production problem. And your friend says, this is exactly like that time a year ago when this happened, and no one can remember how to fix it. So make sure you write up what happened and what the solution was. And at the FT, we find that most of our value comes from identifying follow-up actions, because arguably they're the most important part of this whole process. What could have prevented the problem, and what can be fixed or improved for next time? That might be code or infrastructure, or it might be process and procedure. Make sure that these get done. This is a good example of an incident report from Travis CIO, who I've got nothing against. I just thought it was a very nice report. Um, and I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but what happened was an environment variable on a developer's machine was pointing to the production database. And when someone ran a test, it dropped their database. But this then turned into a fairly big security problem because user IDs then got reset. And when people logged in, they found out that they'd logged in as someone else with access to their personal information and their payment details. And fortunately for Travis CI, GDPR wasn't quite in play yet. So, And as part of their report, they included their follow-up actions. It's a clear list of things that they have done or are going to do to mean that problems shouldn't happen again, or at least reduce the chance of it happening. In this case, they removed truncate permissions and added the prompt warning as well. So work out what can be improved for next time, and this can include multiple things as well. We had an outage at a different previous company where a BA did something very similar. They ran scripts against a production database thinking they were connected to pre-production. So the reason that I tell this story is because the production database was called prod, which is fairly standard, and you might expect that. But the pre-production database was called pprod. <laughs> so I didn't name it, but top of our list of actions was rename that database and don't give databases really similar names in future, and restrict access to production so that people can't accidentally connect to it. <laughs> so, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover today, and I hope that you found it interesting and useful. To sum up, Instants and issues are just another part of what we deal with in technology. And it's how we plan for them, respond to them, and improve things afterwards that really makes the difference. For those of you that are new to support, I hope I've not completely scared you off. And hopefully you've got some ideas of what you can go away and do things. After, oh, yeah, sorry. So thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah.